Hi there and welcome to another podcast. So this is podcast number two and uh, just like the first podcast we will be looking at an industrial leader or a leader of any type um, via the wonderful world of my notes and also Wikipedia. So we're going to go on this little journey together and today we're going to be talking about Andrew Carnegie. Now I first learned about Andrew Carnegie when I read the book Think and Grow Rich. Now from that I discovered that it's he was a lot bigger influence on American industry than I originally thought. So let's have a little dive in on who he is and especially US Steel and how it was how it was made basically. So if you haven't read Think and Grow Rich I do recommend you do so because it is absolutely a fantastic read. Uh, I actually have the book and also the audio book. I actually prefer listening to audios, hence I quite like doing podcasts. So let's have a little look. So Andrew Carnegie, who was he? Well, obviously you can Google him straight away and you'll see a picture of him. And you'll have probably seen a picture on the thumbnail. So Andrew Carnegie was born in 1835 and died August the 11th, 1919. So I can't do quick math, so you can just have to figure that one out yourself. So Carnegie led an expansion of the American steel industry in the 19th century and became one of the richest Americans in history. He became a leading philanthropist in the United States and the British Empire. During the last 18 years of his life, he gave away around $350 million, roughly $5.2 billion in 2020, almost 90% of his fortune to charities, foundations and universities. His 1889 article proclaiming the gospel of wealth called on the rich to use their wealth to improve society, express support, pro- pro- progressive taxation and estate tax, and sim- stimulated a wave of philanthropy. Which is really good because you don't really hear about that much anymore. But to be fair, actually, a lot of people do give away you know, some money. I dare say when... Um, Bill Gates dies, some money's going to go away to charity and obviously Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. But anyway, those are for different days. Uh, so Carnegie was born in Dunfermline, Scotland and emerged into the United States to his parents in 1848. At the age of 12, Carnegie started as a telegrapher. And in the 1860s, his investments in railroads, railroad sleeping cars, bridges and oil derricks. He accumulated further wealth as a bond salesman, raising money for the American enterprise into Europe. He built the Pittsburgh Carnegie Steel Company, which he sold to P.J. Morgan in 1901 for $303 million dollars and it formed the basis for the U.S. Steel Company. After selling Car- Carnegie Steel, Carnegie surpassed... John D. Rockefeller as the richest American and for the next seven years. Carnegie devoted the remainder of his life to large-scale philanthropy and special emphasis on local libraries, world peace, education, scientific research. With the fortune he made from business, he built Carnegie Hall in New York and Peace Palace and founded Carnegie Corporation of New York. Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Carnegie Institution for Science, Carnegie's Trust for the Universities of Scotland, Carnegie Hero Fund, being modest, Carnegie Mellon University and Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh, among others. So, I'm not going to go too much into his early life because if you really want to look at that, you can look at that yourself. I'm not really interested in that part of his life, although it is interesting. And, and like I said, Think and Grow Rich does go into it a little bit. Uh, but I'm interested in U.S. Steel. So, industrialist. So, Carnegie did not want to marry during his mother's lifetime. Instead, he chose to take care of her and her illness towards the end of her life. 
After she died in 1886, the 51-year-old Carnegie still married Louise Wiltford, who was 21 years his junior, okay, in 1897. And the couple had their only daughter, child, a daughter, whom they named after Carnegie's mother, Margaret. Carnegie made his fortune in the steel industry, controlling the most ex extensive integrated iron and steel operations ever owned by an individual in the United States. One of his two innovations was cheap and efficient mass production of steel and adopting and adapting the Besser process, which allows for a high carbon content of pig iron to be burnt away in a controlled and rapid way during steel production. Again, I'm not a steel production person, but that sounds incredibly complicated. If you are a steel person, by the way, just drop it in the comment and try and educate me if you can, or let me know and we'll actually get you on and we'll have a nice podcast episode learning about steel. Steel prices dropped as a result and Bassamer steel was rapidly adopted for rails. However, it was not suitable for buildings and bridges. Second was the vertical integration of all suppliers of raw materials. So this is basically the birth of supply chains. So as you see in business today, you'll have a network of businesses feeding one business, which then sells the ultimate end product. And also you have it the other way. So you have, let's say, from what I learned from Think and Grow Rich, you've got the Andrew, uh, the Carnegie Steel Corporation not only held all the mines in which to get the raw material he needed, he also invented products to sell to market. So by that I mean it will be wiring, it will be steel cables, it will be um, steel girders. He, he had no interest in it to begin with, but then he created businesses that needed it at the end and also their products that they needed, which could then sell to other industries. So where was I? So Carnegie bought the rival Homestead Steelworks, which included an extensive plant served by a tributary coal and iron fields, a 425-mile long railroad, and a line of lake steamships. Carnegie combined his assets and those of his associates in 1892 and launched the Carnegie Steel Company. So he's been busy. I mean, he did all that between 1885 and 1900. So he did that in 15 years. So what, when, hold on, when did he start that? In 1880s? So he was 50 years old when he started this little steel empire by the looks of it. Obviously, he did, he did other things as well. So his, uh, he was in, before the Civil War, Carnegie arranged to merge the Wolf's company. So, hold on, let's just go back a bit. So in 1849, Carnegie became a telegraph messenger for the railroads. So he really started his, so from 1849, he worked in the railroads, he was in the Civil War, he worked for Keystone Bridge Company. And then in 1885, he started his steel empire. So basically, very similar to what I'm, I'm starting to view my life as. It's, he's done loads of different kind of jobs which have led him to a certain point. Obviously, I'm not comparing myself to Andrew Carnegie, but I'm just saying. For, for, for like layman's terms and on, on, on comparisons. So everything he led up to, led up to the, his steel empire, basically. So by 1889, the US output of steel exceeded that of the UK, and Carnegie owned a large part of it. Carnegie's empire grew to include the J. Edgar Thompson Steel Works, uh, okay. John Edgar Thompson, Carnegie's former boss and president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Pittsburgh Besser Steel Works and Lucy Furnaces. I hope that was made by a woman called Lucy. Especially back in then, in them days. That'd be brilliant. The Union Iron Mills. The Union Iron Mills was a Wilson Walker and County Company. The Keystone Bridge Works. The Hartman Steel Works. The Frick Coke Company. The Scotter Ore Mines. 
and Carnegie through Keystone supplied the steel for and owned shares in the landmark of Ed's Bridge, a project across the Mississippi River and St. Louis, Missouri, completed in 1874. The project was an important proof of concept for the steel technology which marked the opening of the new steel market. Yeah, so obviously figured out how to get steel for bridges in. So, U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel. In 1901, Carnegie was 66 years old and considered retirement. He reformed his enterprises into conventional joint stock corporations as preparation for this. John Pierpont Morgan was a banker and the America's most important financial dealmaker. He had observed how efficiently Carnegie produced profits. He envisaged an integrated steel industry that would cut costs, lower prices to consumers, producing greater quantities and raise wages for workers. So again, you can still, you can still see these principles that John Pierpont Morgan had envisioned in different industries all over the world now. I dare say it's still in the steel industry. So he wanted to cut costs, lower prices to consumers, and produce a greater quantities and raid wages for workers. To this end, he needed to buy out Carnegie and several other major processors and integrate them into one company, thereby eliminating duplication and waste. He concluded negotiations on March 2nd, 1901 and formed the United States Steel Corporation. It was the first corporation in the world to be marketed capitalization over one billion dollars god if you look at the tesla stock now that's actually... the buyout s- secretly negotiated by charles m schwab he's another one so if you've read think and grow rich charles m schwab was i believe his vice president bear with me one second let me just click on his name charles m schwab uh, he, so he was an engineer at Carnegie Steelworks, da, 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 Pennsylvania, he was promoted often, including the position of general superintendent of Homestead Works, superintendent of Ed, Edgar Thomas Steelworks, and he became president of Carnegie Steel Corporation, and in 1901 helped negotiate the secret sale of Carnegie Steel to a group of New York-based financial investors. So yeah, so he was the president of Carnegie Steel at one point. And obviously Andrew Carnegie probably knew him very well. Um, The buyout secretly negotiated by Charles M. Schwab was the largest such industrial takeover in the United States history to date. The holdings were incorporated in the United States Steel Corporation, a trust organization by Morgan and Carnegie retired from the business. His steel enterprises were bought for $303,450,000. Carnegie's share of this amount, uh, Carnegie's share amounted to $225.64 million. So in today's money, that would be $7 billion. Oh my God. Which was paid to Carnegie in the form of 5% 50-year gold bonds the letter agreed to sell his share was signed in February 26, 1901, on March the 2nd. The circular formation filing of the organization, blah, 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 capitalization at 1.4 billion US gross domestic product. So that was 4% of the US gross domestic product at the time. So that's everything produced in America. The United States Steel Corporation actually completed the contract. The bonds were to be delivered within two weeks to the Hudson Trust Company of Hodbocken, New Jersey, and a trust to Robert A. Franks, Carnegie's business secretary. There, a special vault would be built to house the physical bulk of nearly $230 million in bonds. You can imagine that. Building a vault just to hold your bonds. Well, I wouldn't even do that. I'd just be all numbers transferred. And never actually, money isn't physical anymore. Even bonds aren't physical. Well, I don't think they are anyway. You might still get a piece of paper. 
so let's see what else we can find about him. How did he die? Carnegie died on August 11th, 1911 in Massachusetts at his Shadowbrook estate. He'd given away the majority of his fortune after his death. His last 30 million was given to foundation charities and pensioners. He was buried in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Brilliant. I like Sleepy Hollow sound of that. Sleepy Hollow, New York. And if you're too young and you haven't seen Johnny Depp's Sleepy Hollow, go watch it. It's really quite funny. Well, it's, it's nearly Halloween as well, so... Well, I believe this will be going out after Halloween, but anyway. It's around Halloween. The gravesite is located at Arcadia Hebron plot of land at the corner of the Summit Avenue and Dingle Road. Carnegie is buried only a few yards away from the union organiser Samuel... Gompers, whoever Samuel Gompers is. Not really sure who Samuel Gompers is, but he's got a great name. So, right, so. What am I looking for? What am I looking for? So, who is John Pierpont Morgan then? So, here's a little bit about him. So, John Pierpont Morgan was an American financier and banker who dominated corporate finance on Wall Street. Throughout the Gilded Age, he headed a banking firm, ultimately became known as J.P. Morgan & Co. Uh, being the driving force, that gave it industrial consolidation in the United States spanning the 19th and earliest 20th century. Over the course of his career at Wall Street, he spearheaded the formation of several prominent multinational corporations, including U.S. Steel, International Harvester and General Electric, which subsequently fell under the supervision. He and his partner also controlled interests. Oh, that's, that's not what we're here for. I'm getting sidetracked. Ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. I don't know whether you're interested, but he had something to do with Nikola Tesla. He's another wayward character that I find fascinating. In 1900s, the inventor Nikola Tesla convinced Morgan he could build a transatlantic wireless communication system, eventually sited at Wardenclyffe, that would outperform the short-range radio wave-based wireless telegraph system that's being demonstrated by... <sighs> Bear with me. Gul... Guglielmo Macaron, M Marconi, sorry, Macaron, Marconi. Go I can't pronounce that. Morgan agreed to give Tesla five hundred and fifty thousand, equivalent to four point six million today, to build the system in a return for a fifty-one percent controlling share of all patents. Almost as soon as the contract was signed, Tesla decided to scale up the facility to include his ideas of terrestrial wireless power transmission to make what he thought was a more competitive system. Morgan considers Tesla's changes a request for the additional amounts of money to build it, a breach of contract, and he refused to fund the changes. With no additional investment capital available, the project was abandoned in 1996 and never became operational. Sounds exactly like Nikola Tesla. A great man, but very wayward. So many ideas and had no way of actually producing it. Anyway. So, what am I doing? So, I'm actually losing my place here. Hold on, where am I? Okay. Sorry, bear with me. I will be a little bit backwards and forwards until I get into the... I'll get into a swing of this and we'll get this more ironed out. Hopefully you can bear with me. So let's find out what he did on the railroads then. So in 1849, Carnegie became a telegraph messenger boy for the Pittsburgh office of the Ohio Telegraph Company. At two pound, two pound, two dollars fifty per week. So that's seventy eight dollars a week in today's money, following the recommendation of his uncle. He was a hard worker and would memorize the location of the businesses and the faces of important men. He made many connections this way. He also paid close attention to his work and quickly learned to distinguish the different sounds of the incoming telegraph signals produced. He developed the ability to translate signals by ear without using a paper slip. 
and with a year was promoted to operator. Carnegie's education and passion for reading was given a boost by Colonel James Anderson, who opened his personal library of 400 volumes to working boys each Saturday night. Not even going to go there with that one. Carnegie was considered borrower and a self-made man in both his economical development and his intellectual and cultural development. He was so grateful to Colonel Anderson for the use of his library, and he resolved, if ever wealth came to be for him, that other poor boys might receive the opportunity similar to those for which he was afforded, and indebted to this noble man. His capacity and willingness for hard work, his perseverance, and his alertness soon brought him opportunities. Starting in 1853, when Carnegie was around 18 years old, Thomas A. Scott of the Pennsylvania Railway Company employed him as a secretary stroke telegraph operator with a salary of $4 per week. So that's $124 today. Carnegie accepted the job with the railroad as he saw more prospects for career growth and experience there with the telegraph company. So at the age of 24, Scott and Carnegie if he could handle being more superintendent of the Western Division of the Pennsylvania Railway. On December the 1st, 1859, Carnegie officially became superintendent of the Western Division. Carnegie then hired his 16-year-old brother, Tom, to be his personal secretary and telegraph operator. Not only did Carnegie hire his brother, but he also hired his cousin, Maria Hogan, who became his first female telegraph operative. Also, he was a forward thinker even back then. As superintendent, Carnegie made a salary of $1,500 a year, so that would be about $43,000 today. His employment by the Pennsylvania Railway Company would be vital in later success. The railroads were a big business to America, and Pennsylvania was one of the largest of them all. Carnegie learned much more about management and cost control during these years, from the Scott in particular, which is always real good. If you're ever in a position to own your own business, or if you're thinking of owning one, learn, if you currently work for someone, learn how they manage their money. Especially if you want to go into a similar sort of industry, or just go off on your own doing the same thing. The lessons that you can learn... It's amazing. And nine times out of ten, these people will give up this information quite freely. They're, they want to pass on their knowledge. Because you, if, you're in, if you're enthusiastic, they're more than likely to, to give you that information. Scott also helped him with his first investments. Many of these were part of a corporation indulged by Scott and Pennsylvania Prison. Uh, John Edgar Thomas, which considered of inside training. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, so he's involved in some corruption scandals and insider trading in companies and railway did business with. All payoffs made to contract parties. Oh, God, why, why can none of these people be clean? Completely clean. In 1855, Scott made it possible for Carnegie to invest $500 in the Adams Express which contracted with the Pennsylvania to carry its messages. The money was secured by his mother placing of five of a six hundred dollar mortgage on the family's seven hundred dollar home. Imagine that having a home that cost seven dollars, seven hundred dollars. But the opportunity was available only because of Carnegie's close relationship with Scott. A few years later he received a few shares in the Theodore Tuttle Woodruff's Sleeping Car Company as a reward for holding shares in the Woodruff was given to Scott and Thomas as a payoff. Reinvesting his returns in such inside investments in the railroad related industries, iron bridges, bridges and rails, Carnegie slowly accumulated capital for his basis of larger success. Throughout his later career, he made use of his close connections with Thomas and Scott as he established his business that supplied rail bridges and railroads, offering the two men a stake in his enterprises. So I don't know whether we really want to go into the Civil War. What happened in the Civil War? The Spring Agent was appointed by Scott. 
as now Assistant Secretary of War. Okay, okay. In spring 1861, Carnegie was appointed by Scott, who was the Assistant Secretary of War in charge of military transportation, as Superintendent of Military Railroads and the Union Government's Telegraph Lines of the East. Carnegie helped open the rail lines into Washington, D.C. that the rebels had cut off. He rode the locomotive, putting the 1st Brigade of Union troops within reach of Washington, D.C., following the defeat of the Union forces at Bull Run. He personally supervised transportation of the defeated forces. Under his organisation, the Telegraph Service rendered efficient service to the Union's cause and significantly assisted the eventual victory. Carnegie later joked that he was the first casualty of the war when he gained a scar on his cheek from freeing a trapped telegraph wire. Brilliant. Uh, the feet of the Confederacy required vast supplies of munitions as well as the railroads to deliver the goods. The war demonstrated how integral the industries were to American success. So, let's learn a little bit more about him, about the Keystone Bridge Company, and then I think that's it, to be honest. I think we've... I mean, I only want to give you a basic overview. You can also go and have a look at yourself if you want to look at all this a bit more. I just want to give you a basic overview, and I find it fascinating. I mean, I've learned a little bit more tonight than I knew than I before. So. Yeah. So in 1864, Carnegie was one of the early investors in the Columbia Oil Company. In one year, the farm yielded $1 million in cash dividends, and petroleum from oil wells was pop propriously sold profitably. The demand for iron products such as armour for gunboats, cannons and shells, as well as hundreds of other industrial products made Pittsburgh a centre of wartime production. Carnegie worked with others to establishing a steel rolling mill and the steel production control industry became the source of his fortune. Carnegie had some investments in the iron industry before the war. After the war, Carnegie left the railroads to devote his energies into the ironworks trade. Carnegie worked to develop several ironworks, eventually forming Keystone Bridge Works and Union Ironworks in Pittsburgh. Although he had left for Pennsylvania Railroad Company, he remained connected to its management, namely Thomas A. Scott and J. Edgar Thomas. He used his connections to the two men to acquire con contracts for the Keystone Bridge Company, and the, rails, and the rails produced by his ironworks. He also gave stock to Scott and Thomas in his business, and the Pennsylvania was his best customer. When he built his, the, his first steel plant, he made the point of naming it after Thomas, as well as having a good business sense, Carnegie possessed charm and literal knowledge. He was invented, invited, not invented, to many important social functions and Carnegie exploited to his advantage. I think I've just found a spelling mistake on Wikipedia. He says, it says here, he was invent... Invo no, it's me, I can't spell. Let's just ignore that. Carnegie <laughs> believed using his fortune for others and doing more to make money. So this is a, apparently a written quote by him. And we shall finish on this written quote. I propose to take an income no greater than $50,000 per, $50, per annum. Beyond this, I need either ever earn, make no effort to increase my fortune, but set, spend the surplus each year for benevolent purposes. Let us cast aside business forever, except for others. Let us settle in Oxford and I shall get a thorough education making the acquaintance of literal men. I figure that this will take three years active work. I shall pay special attention to speaking in public. We can settle in London and I can purchase a controlling interest in some newspaper or live review and give a, the general management of the attention. Taking, a part, taking part in public matters, especially those connected with the education and improvement of poorer classes. Really good. He needed to do this. This is, this is actually a, a big way to call to actually people in his position in the modern world. So anyway, let's get back to it. Man must have no idol and amassing of wealth is one of the worst species of 
I did that. I... Anyway, it's really bad. No idol is more debasing than the worship of money. Whatever I engage in, I must push inaudibly. Therefore, should I be careful to choose that life which will be the most elevating into my character? To continue much longer overwhelming my business cares and with most of my thoughts wholly upon the way to make money in the shortest time must degrade me beyond hope of permanent recovery. I will resign business at 35 but during these ensuing two years I wish to spend the afternoon receiving instruction in the reading systematically. It's really good really found that quite interesting hopefully you have i mean hopefully i haven't just wasted literally 30 minutes of your time but anyway i appreciate it if you have stuck it out this long so anyway that's a little bit of story about andrew carnegie and u.s steel uh, i hope you've enjoyed yourself and uh, i will hopefully see you in the next episode